If you're recruiting for any of these roles, odds are you'll come across some mental math interview questions like what's 32 times 28 or what's the sum of integers from 1 to 100. Admittedly, these look super daunting at first, but they do have some secret techniques you can spot to solve them. To practice this, let's go over some of the most common numerical interview questions from easy to hard. Broadly speaking, there's three main types of numerical interview questions, which are mental math, market sizing, and logic. In my opinion, mental math are among the easier ones to solve, while I find the logic ones the hardest. So let's go over each one, starting with mental math interview questions. First up here, we've got what is 17 times 23? And at first, this might look like an impossible task, but there is a pattern that you can spot. You might have identified that both of these numbers go up and down from 20 by 3. So what you can do is get the average of the two, which is just 20, and then square it to get 400. Once you have that 400, you then want to find the difference to that average. So 17 is plus 3, and then it's minus 3 from 23 to 20. That means that we want to square that, so 3 squared equals 9. And finally, we just need to calculate the difference between both outputs. So that's 400 minus 9 to reach 391, which is the correct answer. That's just one example, so you might think maybe we got lucky with this one. So let's go over a separate example with that same pattern. You can see here that it now says 32 times 28, so that's plus 2 and minus 2 relative to 30. So our average is 30 and we need to square that again, that's 900, easy enough. From here we want to find the difference again, so plus 2 minus 2, that's gonna be 2 squared, so that's just a 4. And finally we can calculate the difference between these two outputs, so 900 minus 4 equals 896. So using this method, we've gone from a multiplication that seemed very difficult to do in your head to one that's actually a lot more digestible and it is very common to get asked questions where they have the same amount in difference relative to an average number. Now looking at a different type of mental math interview question, over here we have what is 16 squared? So much like before, this looks very difficult to do, but we need to break it down further. So we know that 16 squared is just 16 times 16, but in fact, to make that a lot more digestible, it might be easier to split it further into 16 times 10 and 16 times 6. The first part is very easy, it's just 160, so that's gonna be 10 times 6, which is just a 60, and 6 times 6, which is just 36. With those two, we get 96 as our answer, and we now need to add the 2. So the initial one was 160, and we want to add the further 96 to reach a total of 256. Awesome! So you can see that with this method, it's also a lot more digestible to do. Let's go over another example of this so you can test yourself. Here we've got 18 squared, so it's gonna follow a very similar pattern. We want to split that further. 18 times 10 is easy enough, that's just 180. And then 18 times 8, that's not so intuitive, so we can break it down further. That's 18 times 8, so that's 80, and 8 times 8 is 64. That gives us a total of 144, and we now just want to add the two parts like we did before. So 180 plus 144 equals 324. That's the idea with mental math interview questions. And now we can move on to market sizing or guesstimate questions. The unusual part about this type of interview question is that they're not actually asking for a specific number. Instead, they're just looking to see how you approach the problem and what steps you take. So let's see an example. Here we've got how many smartphones are sold in the US each year. For most people, just off the top of their head, they're not going to know what the answer to this question is. Instead, they want you to see what kind of reasoning and assumptions you make to reach an answer. So we can either take a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach. A top-down would start with the country and then trickle down to specific numbers, whereas a bottom-up would be like, hey, let's start with one family first, see how many smartphones they own, and then move up the ranks all the way to the country level. So for this case, let's go with a top-down. And the first assumption here is that the US has a population of 300 million people. In reality, I think that number is more like 330, but I'll explain why I'm using 300 later. Then we go assuming that 80% own a smartphone, 
I think that's a fair estimate given that some elderly people don't use a smartphone and same thing goes for some children below a certain age. So we're saying that 80% of the population owns a smartphone. With that, we can calculate 300 million times 80% and that's just 240 million. Then we need to make another key assumption, which is how often people replace their iPhones. If you recall, the question is how many iPhones were sold, not how many people own an iPhone. Let's suppose that people replace their smartphone every 2.5 years. That means that the ratio of replacements is 1 to every 2.5 or it's just 0.4, which is 40% of the users replace their smartphones every year. With that, we can calculate that 0.4 times 24 is 96 million. And if you struggle with that last calculation, there is a way to make it easier, which is simply by going for 0.1 first. So 0.1 of 240 million is just going to be 24 million. With that, you want to then multiply it by 4, or you can multiply it by 2 and then by 2 again if it's easier for you. And before we go over another market sizing question, which I understand they're fairly difficult, let's go over some key tips. First up, we've got thinking out loud. It's important that you actually explain your thought process. So if you're really going the wrong way, the interviewer can interrupt you and tell you, hey, you should focus more on this area, for instance. Secondly, don't be afraid to ask for a hint. Maybe the question instead of the smartphones that are sold every year in the US, it's actually in just New York. But if you're not sure about what this means, whether it's New York State or the city of New York, you can always ask for further context and even get a hint as to what the population might be if you're not sure. Thirdly, it's important that you keep it simple. In my case, you see I went for 300 million instead of 330 or 335 million, which would make my calculations a lot more difficult. The nice thing about this type of question is that you control whatever you want to say in terms of the assumptions. So always try to make your life easier with some rounded numbers. And finally, you want to take your time. It's completely okay to say, let me get a few seconds to gather my thoughts before I give you an answer. That's totally fine as long as you let them know. Now let's go over another market sizing question. Here you can see that it's a pretty different question asking to estimate the revenue of your barbershop per month. This is actually a very common question type. It might be also like how much revenue does a taxi driver make or how much does your local football team make. All of these are similar variations of the same thing. So let's get started and we can assume that the barber sees 20 clients per day. If they ask you to justify that further, maybe you could say your barber works 10 hours a day and so it takes him half an hour to see each client. Then for the pricing, you can say that on average he charges $25. Obviously within a barber, you typically have different types of haircuts you can get. Like maybe you also want your beard cut, all of that which adds more complexity. So what you can do is say usually he charges $30 for a cut plus a beard and just $20 for a regular haircut. So we're taking the average of that to reach 25. To then calculate the revenue per day is simple enough. That's just 20 clients times 25 per client, which is 500. Continuing on, because the question says per month, we need to scale this further. And let's suppose that it's open five days a week. And per month, let's assume that that's just gonna be four weeks. So four times five is 20. With that, we've got 500 multiplied by 20 which is going to be 10,000. Again, just like the previous market sizing question, we kept it quite simple with all the assumptions, which leads us to a very straightforward answer. Next up, we've got logic questions, which I find to be the hardest type of question. That's because they're looking for a specific answer, but the question itself can vary quite a lot. For example, here we've got, what is the sum of integers from one to 100? At first, you might think of just doing 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so forth all the way to 100, but you'll quickly realize it's not very feasible, and so you should probably try to spot a pattern. And the key trick here is to pair them up. So it's gonna be 1 plus 100, then 2 plus 99, 3 plus 98, and that's when you'll start to spot the pattern, which is that each of these pairs adds up to 101. We've got 100 numbers in total from 1 to 100 and we know that these are all in pairs now so it's gonna be 50 total numbers and each of them adds up to 101. That means that it's 50 times 101 which is simply 5050. That's one example of what I refer to as a logic question. 
let's go over another one and you'll see how it's completely different. Over here, it's more of a scenario based question where it's asking if car X is moving at 60 miles per hour towards car Y and car Y is moving at 40 miles per hour towards car X. So they're moving into each other. How long will it take for the cars to collide? They start 200 miles apart. So because these cars are actually moving towards each other, we can add their speeds to get a combined relative speed. That's just going to be the 60 plus the 40 for a combined speed of 100 miles per hour. We know the speed and now we need to find out how long till they collide. And for that, it's just going to be the distance divided by the speed which is 200 divided by 100. That gives us a time to collision of two hours. Finally, here's a fun bonus riddle that you're probably not going to get asked in your interview question. So it's not very useful, but it is fun nonetheless. Here you can see it asks which two words combined hold the most letters. Have a think about it as it is a bit of a trick question. And the answer is just the post office or the mailbox. Hopefully you get that answer and sorry, I couldn't help myself. I had to put it out there. On a serious note, the great part about a lot of these mental math questions is that you can do them anywhere. You can be on your commute and just be thinking about them in your head and you can set them up on your own. Instead of 32 times 28, you can do 33 times 17 and so on and so forth. If you want to learn about finance interview questions specifically, you can watch this video over here or you can take our complete finance evaluation course over here. Hit the like and that subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.